Okay, well, good afternoon, good morning again to everybody. Um, we will go ahead and get started and welcome to uh, State Attorneys General 101. Um, very pleased to be joined today by my co-panelists, um, Beth Chun, who is a senior associate at Kelly Dry, and Abby Stempson, who is the director of the Center for Consumer Protection, uh, which is part of the National Attorneys General Training and Research Institute, which is um, the training arm of the National Association of Attorneys General. I'm Paul Singer. I'm a partner at Kelly Dry. Um, so today we're going to be talking, you know, very high level basics about state AGs and, and primarily their consumer protection authority. Um, very excited about, you know, this discussion with my co-panelists. Um, all three of us, although we are no longer at an attorney general office, worked for a lengthy amount of time in consumer protection divisions at state AG offices. Beth and I came from the Texas AG office. Abby came from the Nebraska AG office. Um, I think collectively we've got somewhere around 40 years of consumer protection AG enforcement experience. So we are very excited to talk to you all today about um, state AG authority generally. Um, so Beth and I have done a, a, a several other webinars where we've talked about specific AG priorities, but we thought today we would take a step back and just talk very generally about AGs, who they are, where their power comes from, um, and then in particular with um, consumer protection, what kind of presence do they, do they play in that space? Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. For those of you that are gonna be seeking CLE for this webinar, uh, I will be reading off a code at the end of the webinar. Um, you should have received a form to report the CLE uh, as part of your registration. There should be a space on that form to put the code in. And um, when I read it off, you'll just wanna enter it into that space. Um, questions, uh, we welcome them. We want you to ask questions. We want you to be engaged. Um, but given the challenges of trying to keep up with questions through the Q&A or chat feature, um, we thought the most productive use of today's time is going to be to go through our presentation, solicit as many questions as we can, and then we're going to follow up with a podcast and we're going to actually answer and address any of the questions that are raised. So please send in your questions throughout um, and just know that we are going to get to them in short order uh, after today's webinar. Finally, just a quick note that the slides that you're going to be seeing today are presented by Kelly Dry. They are not um, from NAG. And so Abby is here as, as our special guest and expert on sort of the training aspect and, and everything that, um, you know, AGs and their staff need to know from the, the consumer protection world. So let's start with, with an, a general background on attorneys general, and, and it is attorneys general, not attorney generals. Um, and I, I emphasize that point both to be grammatically correct, but, but also to highlight the fact that general here is not a title. It's, it's not something that is um, given to particular individuals. General is an adjective that that describes the type of attorney that they are. Um, and it's really important to kind of note that because it, it underscores the breadth of the role that state AGs play for their respective states. They, they are the primary legal advisor for the entire state. So the types of duties that they have um, are incredibly broad. Um, on the civil side, they engage in both affirmative and defensive litigation and, and work. So on the affirmative side, they may be doing things like consumer protection enforcement, antitrust, environmental work. On the defensive side, right, they're going to be involved in um, defending against challenges to um, the constitutionality of state laws. Um, they're going to be representing state agencies in any sort of claims that are brought against those agencies. So uh, just a tremendous amount of workload that is um, put upon AGs. Um, and they enforce and, and are responsible for uh, a variety of state and federal laws, in particular in the consumer protection space. Um, and moreover, they also enforce generally the, the common law and act in a parents patria role um, in a variety of contexts. So um, really, the, the type of work that AGs can do is, is extremely broad, um, and so, you know, it's just important to know the scope and, and importantly, who they are. Um, Abby, can you talk to us a little bit about how AGs get put in place? 
um, and, and really maybe a little bit of a breakdown about who some of the key staff and, and roles are within an office, especially when it comes to consumer protection. Absolutely, Paul. And first, I want to thank you and Beth very much for having me today. I'm excited to be here and talk about attorneys general and consumer protection. So thank you. Uh, so first of all, how do AGs actually get their role? Um, most are elected. There's actually 43 states, DC, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands where they get their spots by popular election. But that's not the case with everyone. So appointment by the governor happens in Alaska, American Samoa, Hawaii, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and Wyoming. And even more interesting, in the state of Maine, the attorney general is selected by secret ballot of the legislature. And then finally, Tennessee is really unique in that the attorney general is actually selected by the Supreme Court. So definitely depends on what jurisdiction you're in as to how a person can become attorney general. And I mentioned a few territories there. So if anybody ever asks you, you know, how many attorneys general are there? It's 56 because there are, of course, 50 states, there's DC, and then there are five territories. Uh, so a little bit of good trivia information there. Now, as for the staff, you know, of course, you have the attorney general at the top, and they typically have like a chief deputy and a chief of staff. But for consumer protection staff, because that's probably who you really want to hear about, um, what the top consumer person is often titled is the consumer protection chief. Um, both Paul and I have served that at points in our life for our uh, offices that we used to be in. Um, so you have a consumer protection chief, and then you have attorneys that work under that chief. And their title is typically like an assistant attorney general, or in some states, it's a deputy attorney general. Um, also, though, in those divisions, there are often investigators. There's complaint specialists. There are people that maybe are tasked simply with doing outreach um, because for consumer protection, and I'm always going to say like typically because with 56 different AG offices, there's always going to be, you know, one where it's a little different, um, but they often are tasked with enforcement, of course, but also education of consumers and mediation. And by mediation, what often occurs is that a consumer will file a complaint with an office and the AG's office will say, okay, we are going to send that along to the business to respond to that business. Um, or excuse me, so that there can be a, a dialogue between the two. Um, so it's not the typical mediation, but it's more of, you know, both parties voluntarily trying to come to a meeting of the minds in regard to some sort of issue. Now, so those are the humans in it and the areas that they look at. Consumer protection, well, a lot of times civil, and Paul remind me, in Texas, it was totally civil. Am I correct? That's right. Okay. So in Nebraska, we actually had civil and criminal jurisdiction for consumer protection because our consumer protection law actually had a criminal component to it. Um, and that is the case in a handful of states. Um, so that's something to um, keep in mind is that there could be a criminal element to the consumer protection statute as well. Um, and the consumer division is often what it's termed or consumer units. Now, as to what is considered consumer really depends on what state you're in. My former state, the consumer division meant consumer protection, charities, antitrust, and tobacco. In larger AG offices, very different. Paul in Texas, if I recall, like charities is very separate from consumer. everything. Everything you just said is a separate division. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yes. So oftentimes, the smaller the office, the more that consumer protection division is going to handle in regard to, you know, types of matters. And then finally, just a few quick things I'll mention is some states have a consumer agency where that also comes into play. So like Hawaii, South Carolina, Utah, and Wisconsin all have a state agency in addition to the attorney general's office that may handle consumer protection measures. And then finally, 
the state of Maryland, for instance, does a lot of their stuff through administrative law. Um, that's not normal, um, but it is out there too. Uh, so th there's, I'll stop talking there, Paul, but that's a little bit of lay of the land on CP enforcement and how offices are structured. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Abby. And 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 one other thing I'll throw in too, right, is that, you know, I, I, I said that the AG doesn't handle, you know, criminal enforcement of deceptive trade practices, but um, our state law in Texas does have a criminal component. It's just that district and county attorneys handle that side of it. So, so you really do have a wide variety of entities or divisions or other agencies that, that may be handling consumer protection. And so knowing the scope of what any particular state AG is actually handling within consumer is, is a really important um, element of, of understanding this background. So this takes us to um, our practice tip number one that, that we want to share, and it's uh, uh, maybe an obvious one, but, but AGs are not uh, the FTC. And there's a lot of distinctions that I want to kind of quickly run through um, that you should all keep in mind as, as you're dealing with a state attorney general. Um, First, uh, I'm sure most of the audience is familiar with the Supreme Court's decision last year um, in the AMG Capital case that um, just affirmed the idea that uh, the FTC can't obtain any monetary recovery under Section 13B. Um, obviously, that ruling doesn't impact state attorneys general, most of whom have explicit restitution authority um, within their state laws. Uh, the FTC has, in response, made very public, um, Chair Khan has, has been explicit in statements that um, they intend to increase partnership with state attorneys general as, as one means to be able to continue to recover monetary relief. Um, but aside from restitution, uh, it's important to remember that most states also include a civil penalty component to their state UDAP laws, some going as high as 50000 per violation. Um, what constitutes a violation is largely undefined in most state law, and so it really does become, you know, a, a, a potential where one particular um, act or, or a series of conduct that an AG is looking at um, could potentially reach astronomical civil penalties um, were the case to, to proceed. Um, so, you know, Obviously, the monetary relief is, is a key difference between states and the FTC, um, but also just understanding what is deceptive or what is unfair under a state UDAP law compared to the FTC may, it may be the same. It may be vastly different. So, for example, while the FTC under deception has uh, established the reasonable consumer standard for quite some time now, many states still don't follow that. And so again, knowing what the particular standard is that's gonna be applied in a state is also important before you're, you're engaging with that AG. Um, and then finally, knowing sort of what your, whether or not your industry is covered by a particular state UDAP law is, is also important. Um, while the FTC includes exclusions for entities like common carriers or nonprofits, um, many state laws don't. And so, you know, an entity that may not be subject to uh, FTC oversight um, may be from a state attorney general. So again, there's a lot of variance among those state laws and just knowing that is, is critical. Um, as a, as a former enforcer and someone that, you know, listened to a lot of uh, pitches in the past about, you know, conduct from entities, I can tell you one pet peeve that, that I used to have is if someone would come in and say, well, you know, our conduct, um, you know, is permissible under FTC standards, or, you know, we don't think that what we're doing violates the FTC Act. Um, obviously, that may or may not matter when it comes to a state UDAP law. Um, most states do have some reference to deference to the FTC. Um, again, what degree that means is varied. In Texas, for example, uh, we're instructed to look to the uh, FTC for, for guidance on um, interpretations. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not really clear how binding anything that the FTC does will be on the state AG when, when he's seeking enforcement. So, um, you know, just understanding these differences is, is critical. 
Finally, I'll note uh, resource constraints. I think this is one that is universally different between states and the FTC. Uh, there is no state AG office that comes close to matching the size of the FTC and the resources of the FTC. And some of the results of that are both uh, seen in terms of the types of priorities or, or entities that state AGs may go after. They may, for example, want to look for low-hanging fruit or something that they're going to be able to pursue uh, with limited resources. Um, it may also result in AGs deciding they want to band together and work collectively in what's called a multi-state um, in order to pool resources and, and sort of gain that advantage um, that you know, they, they may not have otherwise had. So Beth, do you want to talk a little bit about um, where AG cases come from? Sure. So as you can see from this graphic here, um, state AG offices can receive information from a variety of sources uh, that can ultimately lead to uh, case selection by those offices. And uh, most people think first of consumer complaints. Um, but as Abby was mentioning, state AG offices do handle consumer complaints somewhat differently. Um, in general, they do at least track trends to help determine enforcement priorities. Um, also, state AGs may have access to uh, the FTC's Consumer Sentinel database and may be able to review complaints through there. Um, and they also may look at other investigators, and uh, they may go um, look on the internet, and once they have a target, for more consumer complaints there. Um, another I've lost Beth's audio. Abby, Possible are you that. not hearing? Beth, we, yeah. you are you are breaking in and out. Oh no. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> a problem. Okay. Now we hear you. So start yeah. back where you just were. Okay. Um, should I try calling in? Do you think? Can you all hear no, me? No. Go ahead. We can hear okay. you. Go ahead. Okay. Start back where I was. Right. This at the last BBB. point. The last. Okay. Yes. Um, so the BBB is a source of complaints, but it's also a source of information as well, searching the BBB's actual website for any potential alerts. And the BBB may sometimes proactively reach out to state AG offices to provide information to them directly. Uh, and this, this may also be through an NAD. Oh, you're, cut out you're cutting in and out again, Beth. Okay, I will try calling in. See, okay, Abby, audio. you want to pick up where, where Beth left off on, on some of the sources, and Beth, you can try calling in for audio. Absolutely. So one of the um, things in the slide is state officials. Um, as you can imagine, in states, you work with all sorts of agencies, and you kind of figure out which agencies also get consumer complaints that may fall under that agency's jurisdiction, but also may be of interest to an attorney general office. Um, so for instance, like the Department of Insurance, Department of Banking, those types of agencies often are going to get contacted by consumers who maybe have had issues with someone regulated under those agencies. Um, so just know that those agencies often also have like a consumer complaint department or someone who handles those types of communications. Um, in addition, in a lot of states, you know, you just work together with folks that may have similar jurisdiction. So like in Nebraska, I used to run the white collar fraud task force. And so we got together, oh, I don't know, periodically every month and, you know, talked about issues that were going on um, because with limited resources, you definitely wanted to make sure not everyone was investigating the same person. So that's um, some of the state official information that where you can get cases from. Thanks, Abby. Um, can you all hear me better now? Okay. Thanks. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so another source of information could be from the media. So of course, investigators or other uh, people in state AG's offices may see actual media reports, but also the media may proactively contact an AG's office regarding a story. And um, that would, of course, prompt the AG's office to look more into whatever the concern was from the media report. 
Uh, also, Consumer Protection Division staff are consumers themselves. And so since they're some of the most eagle-eyed consumers out there due to their practice, um, if they experience a problem in the marketplace in their own lives, they may look further into it and see if it is a more widespread public issue um, that, that could affect more people. And um, so that's just another thing to keep in mind that they are consumers too. Uh, competitors, we're going to talk about a little bit more. Um, they may also bring concerns to the AG's attention, but as we'll discuss, uh, the AG offices may take some of those with a grain of salt. Um, and there are also various kinds of meetings where state AGs may um, meet with different organizations, including each other and uh, federal agencies to discuss different topics where that may result in identifying targets. So, uh, so once the matter has kind of come to an AG's attention through one of these sources, then the challenge is due to the limited resources Paul was talking about earlier, um, that there has to be a way for the offices to prioritize all of that information. And um, so some of these factors that we'll discuss here are ways that offices are able to um, prioritize. So the number of impacted consumers is one of the more obvious ones, um, but some of the other ones may be a little bit less so. So Abby, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about the legal development aspect. Yeah, I mean, if you're an AG's office, and Beth has some great other uh, things to consider up there, but you really want to think about the case's legal value, right? Like, what's the likelihood that you're actually going to get a favorable result? If restitution or penalties are awarded, can you collect them? Um, you know, I've had many a case where that was something that came into play that you could have went to town on this case, and they absolutely violated the law. But there might have been nothing there. Um, you also want to think about what is the precedential value of the case? You know, is it going to impact the development of consumer law in the states or even nationwide? And things like, is it going to have a general deterrent effect or maybe even a specific deterrent effect for others to not do the same thing? Um, is the case going to stop the deceptive or illegal practice before it becomes widely used by others in the same industry? Um, and then does it protect the public by making it unnecessary for competitors to adopt a similar practice because of economic necessity? So those are some of the, you know, legal value questions that may be running through the minds of the Attorney General Office. Thanks. And that actually segues really well into the next factor on the left, um, the harm to consumers and businesses, because um, if there is a sort of harm to the marketplace as a whole because of a, a um, what is perceived as a bad player by the AG's offices, um, then that could be another a, another aspect of, of protection that AGs may want to consider. But not only that, but businesses may also be consumers under some state AG stat, uh, consumer protection statutes. So actual harm to businesses themselves may be a uh, direct consideration too. Um, and then of course the actual harm or damages to, cons to more typical types of consumers is another consideration, although it's not necessarily a determinative factor for um, states as far as uh, being required to show damages to obtain relief as, as many states do not actually require a showing of, of damages to obtain that. Um, another point is, um, again, not necessarily determinative, but um, another aspect that may be considered is if a case has already been addressed by the private bar class actions um, or other ways uh, that customers, um, consumers may have received relief already uh, from the com company itself, for instance, then um, that is another aspect to consider from the AG's office standpoint. Uh, then. Um, we've already talked a lot about uh, media and state officials. Um, we'll mention them in a minute, but vulnerable populations too are um, often a special consideration for AGs. And uh, Abby, do you want to describe some of those um, recent actions AGs have taken regarding those populations? Sure. A couple that I'll mention is, um, you know, children. Everyone wants to protect children. And recently, there was announced by a bunch of AGs a nationwide investigation into TikTok 
for providing and promoting its social media platform to kids and young adults, um, while the use is associated with physical and mental health harms, or at least that's the allegations, right? Um, so these AGs are examining whether the company violated state consumer protection laws that put the public at risk. Uh, they're looking into things like, you know, are the harms, uh, are there harms like, or I should say, is TikTok using techniques to boost user engagements, increasing the duration of time spent on the platform and frequency of engagement with the platform? And like back in May of 2021, there was a bipartisan coalition of 44 AGs who urged Facebook to abandon its plans to launch a version of Instagram for kids under 13. In November 2021, AGs from across the country announced their investigation in Meta, formerly known as Facebook, for providing and promoting social media platform Instagram to kids. So that is really a hot topic right now. I mean, if you Google attorneys general and social media and children, you will find a lot of information in that regard. Um, veterans are another vulnerable population, of course. Well, they are... AG's focus, I should say, on protecting them big time. And recently there was a Florida-based veterans charity, which was called Healing Heroes Network, and its former directors who reached a settlement with 11 states based on allegations of deceptive appeals, which included misleading sweepstakes. Um, they also, the allegations were that the organization made false claims in social media that 100% of the proceeds would help wounded veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, which may, oh, well, allegedly was not true. Um, so veterans are another population that definitely the AGs are working hard to protect. Um, and of course, uh, elderly, you will see a lot of actions or in a lot of education. Um, AGs spend a ton of time um, like I gave speeches in so many nursing homes, I have probably lost count to uh, elderly individuals on how to protect themselves. Because of course, once they send money to a scam artist or, um, you know, go buy $5,000 in gift cards from whatever corner store to pay for their grandchild that's supposedly in a Mexican jail, I mean, the money's gone. Um, and I assume in Texas, the same thing where education is just huge in regard to trying to help our elderly not fall prey to these camps. Yes, that is true. Um, we, we definitely participated in lots of uh, outreach in the same way. Um, and in fact, my grandma was actually a victim of a grandparent scam very, very early in my uh, career in the AG's office. So I uh, especially emphasize that in, in education presentations. Um, so you see here now that we've uh, circled the state officials and the media uh, because they are aspects that could especially result in prioritization by AGs, um, but because of the, the attention that that comes from those. So with media reports, um, oftentimes if something has reached to the level of a media report, either something um, so egregious has, has purportedly happened or um, enough consumers have been um, reportedly harmed that it's become a media report. And so that can often um, cause AGs to have more interest in it. And especially it can also cause consumers to um, contact AG's offices and other elected officials more often. And as uh, state officials are on there too, because, because they are those elected officials, if their constituents are coming to them with a concern, it's, it's their public duty to um, help resolve concerns. And so that may also uh, bring things to an AG's office attention. So uh, practice tip number two, after you have um, learned about how the AG's offices may prioritize actions, how do you then use that to go about staying off of their radar? Uh, one of the ways you can do that is to monitor consumer complaints in all the different sources that we talked about before and be sure to respond appropriately when you learn of a consumer complaint. Um, you can also keep in mind that you may not always be receiving all state AG complaints 
because um, as Abby was mentioning, that mediation type process does not routinely happen in every state. Uh, that, is, that is kind of on a state by state basis, how that operates. Um, again, as we were mentioning the importance of the media, uh, make sure you monitor the reports about your business. That way you know what the investigators and other state AG staff are also seeing about your business and um, follow the AG meetings and trends. So as we talked about before, uh, one of the sources is that um, AGs often and their staff participate in national meetings where they may discuss um, topics and trends. And there are a number of organizations that specifically include AGs as their members. They uh, hold meetings throughout the year and frequently the AGs themselves may even make statements during those events regarding their priorities um, as well as their staff and those events are sometimes open to public registration for attendance. And uh, finally, seek input and advice early um, and that is to say that as your business is designing new products or services to keep consumer protection in mind throughout um, as and, and these these sources and these um, different priorities in mind. And I'll turn to Paul next to discuss um, some more about what to do if you're on the radar. Yeah, thanks, Beth. And and you know, I uh, obviously all of those are great tips and advice on on trying to stay off the radar, but that may prove impossible, right? I mean, there may be some particular incident that happens even outside of your control that sort of puts you squarely on the radar of an AG. And so knowing what's next when that happens is probably step one, right? So we want to take a minute and just talk about what's in the toolkit of a state AG, um, because it's a pretty big toolkit um, that they have to be able to investigate uh, any particular um, target for you know alleged violations um, of their state UDAP law. Um, and we're going to start with, with probably the most prominent tool that they use, which are civil investigative demands or CIDs. Um, for those that aren't familiar with a CID, it's, it's essentially a civil subpoena for documents. Um, so it, it looks and feels a lot like a request for production. Um, it, it may be you know, styled very similarly, um, but in terms of the scope and the breadth of what AGs are permitted to look at, it's incredibly broad. Um, and so, you know, again, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second, but just know that if you are receiving a CID, I wouldn't be surprised if that CID is going to seemingly request um, what feels like everything that you have, um, because that's that's you know within the reach of of an AG. They they may try to start broad and and expect some discussion around what the scope of that CID should actually be. Um, Probably one of the first things you want to ask yourself if you receive a CID is what level of confidentiality and protection am I going to get for documents that I turn over um, to a state AG? We're going to talk later about um, open records laws generally, but just know that um, every state has some sort of open government law um, that may or may, may or may not make the documents that you produce in response to a CID um, subject to public disclosure in the event that there's an open records request. So step one is figuring out what level of confidentiality exists within a, a particular CID authority. Um, we put a couple of examples here, Massachusetts and Texas. Those are states that include very specific provisions granting confidentiality to documents that are produced. And, and it's incredibly broad protection, right? I mean, it, it is um, pretty solid in terms of the comfort level that you can have turning over those documents. However, it's not complete. There are circumstances where those documents can potentially become public. Um, you know, for example, if a matter is concluded in the event of litigation, um, again, knowing the specific nuances of that state law are going to be really critical before you turn anything over because you want to know and have the comfort level that what you provide is going to have the, the necessary level of protection that, that you expect. Um, turning more specifically to scope, um, like I said before, uh, AGs have incredibly broad authority. Um, the, the first two cases we've listed here, Steele and, and Oklahoma Press Publishing, um, Steele actually relies heavily on, on Oklahoma Press Publishing. Um, and, and these are cases that dealt primarily with whether or not a company could um, 
seek Fourth Amendment protection from an unreasonable search and seizure from, you know, very broad requests for, for information. Um, in both cases, the courts ultimately found no, um, that companies don't enjoy that same protection under the Fourth Amendment, and that, yes, uh, state authority to request documents and information and inspect companies is not only incredibly broad, but it's it goes back to the history of corporations, right? I mean, they've always been subject to state oversight and scrutiny. And so um, states do enjoy very broad power to be able to come in and um, ask for documents, ask for records, and look into matters. Really, the, the primary two requirements as laid out by these cases are that the requests have to be relevant, right? So it actually has to relate to some, you know, in the case of a UDAP violation, um, we know that that particular act or practice that is being alleged to be unlawful. And it needs to be definite, right? It has to have a clear demand um, uh, so that you know exactly what documents are responsive. So long as, as those requests are, are going to be relevant and definite, um, in all likelihood, uh, those requests um, may very well be upheld and, and you should expect to have to respond to them. Um, uh, we've also cited this, the uh, B'nai Jonah case in, in New York. Um, this is just a case, again, to, to demonstrate the expansive nature of CIDs. Um, this was a Medicaid fraud case. And again, the court was very clear that the state has a vested interest in applying um, these standards to you know, do these investigations and, and protect the public from Medicaid fraud. Um, so you know, when, when the state is engaged in these type of affirmative conduct, you should um, you know, expect that courts are generally going to uphold that state authority to be able to conduct um, a, an investigation. And, and just a note here too, um, CIDs, while, while we're talking a lot about CID authority granted under a UDAP law, um, there are a lot of other uh, statutes that may provide for civil investigative demands. Um, in Texas, for example, our antitrust law has a separate CID authority. Our Medicaid Fraud Act has separate CID authority. Human trafficking law has CID authority. Um, and, and each of those CID provisions are slightly different and the protections provided are slightly different. And so again, you really have to know what authority the AG is asserting and then what protections you have in place um, before you're responding. Finally, just a quick note on objections. Um, there are, you know, in, in some laws, there are specific provisions built in on how objections should occur. Some are, are silent on the process. Um, the Twitter v. Paxton case was a, a Ninth Circuit opinion that came out earlier this year um, in which the Ninth Circuit held that Twitter was premature in challenging a CID that the Texas AG's office sent um, because the CID itself was not self-executing. And so because the AG hadn't taken any steps to enforce the CID and hadn't actually alleged specific violations against Twitter yet, um, it was premature to bring an action and in this case assert First Amendment protections against that CID. Um, and the court went on to explain that, you know, to force the state to engage in that challenge at the front end would have essentially required the state to prove its case before they could conduct the discovery in order to prove its case. Um, so again, you know, this is just a, yet another demonstration that, you know, you need to think about the, the steps and processes that you want to put in place um, when you're thinking about how do you want to respond to that CID. Um, so, you know, we, we've talked a lot about CIDs. Just quickly, I'll note that um, different state laws provide for all sorts of other tools that, that may exist. Some states are authorized to take sworn statements of anyone that has relevant knowledge um, relating to that investigation. Those sworn statements look and feel, again, like a lot like a deposition, but they're not governed by rules of procedure. Um, they, you know, arguably, you, you may not have um, uh, a right to have other people in there and attend. Um, again, it's just a very broad authority given to states in order to, to conduct a, a sworn statement and, and obtain recorded testimony from an individual with relevant knowledge. Some states have uh, the ability to ask interrogatories. They can send requests, and again, not governed by specific number. Um, they're, they're able to, to send a wide range and, and can request all sorts of information. Um, Abby, do you want to spend a minute and just tell us a little bit about, you know, all these tools that we've talked about, what might be different if, uh, if whether it's a single state that's asking questions versus several states that come together to ask these questions? 
Absolutely. And Paul, I want to go back to one point you made about there's a, under some state laws, it says how you object to a CID. Um, for folks out there, know that often it states a time frame in which you have to object. And it can be a very short time frame, like 20 days, which is not what I think a lot of people that don't do this normally would expect. Um, so just a hint there that you may want to look and you do really need to follow what the um, statute says. There was a case out of Massachusetts where someone objected to a CID, but they objected by letter and they sent it back to the AG's office. And in the end, the court said, no, you have to answer. You had to file something in court. You didn't. So too bad, too late to object. Um, so just make sure you follow those. Now, single state versus multi-state, if you are getting a CID, um, there's going to be a question of who is sending the CID, right, out of maybe multiple players in a multi-state. And Paul Beth, feel free to jump in by all means, but there's usually a method or, to the reason for that, right? There's major reasoning behind it. Maybe it's based on the law to protect it for confidentiality purposes. Maybe it's because one state um, is able to take in all of those documents, right? Um, a few years ago, not everyone had access to an electronic document review platform. So sometimes a state that actually had resources such as that would be the ones to take in the documents. Um, Paul Best, feel free to add to any of that, uh, but often it comes down to confidentiality and resources. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Abby. And sorry, I've had to shut off my video because now I'm getting internet instability. Um, so um, I want to move on here to uh, tip number three, um, which is first impressions matter, right? Um, so, you know, look, I, I, let me start by saying there are absolutely times and appropriate places where um, you should think about right out the gate challenging the AG authority and, and think about whether or not it makes sense to, you know, challenge the scope of, of an investigation. Um, and, and really, um, you know, I, I don't want to suggest otherwise. Um, but, you know, if, if anything, you know, I, I wanted to talk about sort of this broad authority by AGs because, you know, I think the likely expectation should be that if an AG is bringing this this inquiry and this investigation, they've probably got the basis and the and the suggestion that you know they're going to be um, able to be to move forward if there is a challenge. And so you know I think given this broad authority that they have, you just need to recognize that challenges to that authority may be extremely difficult. And so you know it if if that's the case, it becomes even more important for you to then think about you know what should that first interaction be once you've received a particular investigative request um, from an AG. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, there are a lot of advantages to thinking about that initial request as sort of a, a, an open door and an opportunity, um, because once you receive a request, um, you can pick up the phone and start a dialogue and start a conversation with that AG office in a way that allows you to tell your story. And it gives you sort of a first opportunity to come in, explain exactly what your position is and where you're coming from, um, and you know, really try to lay the groundwork for a more positive resolution and outcome to, to this specific inquiry. AG offices are, you know, universally have an, an open door policy. Um, I don't know of any office that doesn't, uh, uh, you know, allow for that kind of dialogue and conversation. Um, and it really does become, you know, an, a, an opportunity that you at least need to consider on the front end as, you know, something that you may want to explore as a way to, to start to lay that groundwork. Um, it also gives you that opportunity to come in and explain why, you know, particular requests may be extremely problematic for you. Um, it may involve, you know, significant burden to give them the information that, that they need. It gives you an opportunity to understand better the nature of their concerns and figure out what kind of information, um, you know, they really are getting at so that it minimizes your time and expense to have to respond to that request. 
Um, so, you know, it is, it is a valuable tool um, when you're responding. Um, but of course, be thoughtful in how you respond. Um, another pet peeve that I'll just kind of highlight briefly um, is when, you know, somebody would come in when, when we had sent a subpoena and the first request we might get from opposing counsel is, well, tell me which requests are the most important or tell me what information you, you really want. And like, that's, that's probably not a helpful first, first impression because, you know, again, an AG is gonna defend what they sent you. And I think their position is gonna be, well, everything I sent you is important and is, you know, is what I want. That's why I sent you the request. So again, it's thinking about how you engage in that dialogue in a way that helps minimize your burden and resolve the matter quickly and, and very efficiently. So Beth, you want to talk briefly and tell us what are all these multi-states we keep talking about and, you know, where do they come from? Sure. So um, multi-states can form in a few different ways. Um, as we talked about earlier, because the AGs do meet at conferences or they may discuss issues through um, working groups that are um, administered by uh, NAG, um, like using conference lines and things like that, they, uh, they can talk about common issues through those different sources. And if they discover a common problem among themselves, they may decide to tackle it together. And uh, another way that a working um, group or a multi-state may form is because of the relationships that states have developed with each other over time, the staff in those states, uh, they may actually just directly call each other up and say, hey, I've heard of this problem. Um, have you heard about this? And, and they may end up banding together in a more informal way like that. So, um, Abby, can you tell us a little bit more about why states may actually go about forming a multi-state? I know you've talked a little bit about, about that already. Absolutely, quite a few reasons. Um, First of all, is it an important problem that's a priority for multiple AGOs? Also, will it further the development of the law in an area of importance to the AGOs? Is there some sort of advantage, like resources, of course? Um, you also want to often ensure consistent enforcement or standards across jurisdictional lines. No one wants duplication, so a joint action will often avoid unnecessary duplication of effort or avoid subjecting a business or some sort of entity to repeated investigation or litigation. So oftentimes businesses are um, in favor of this. I can tell you a few times where the business called me and said, hey, we need to get all the states on board because we don't want to deal with this in 10 different ways. We really want to get this taken care of in a global fashion so we can resolve all the claims. Um, joint actions also often ensure a level playing field on either some sort of regional or national basis for legitimate business practices. So that can be really helpful. Um, and sometimes some states may not have relief, maybe it's injunctive or other relief that they could get if they just did a single state thing, but they could get it through a multi-state. So that might be another reason where a multi-state may be appropriate. Anything, Paul or Beth, you would add to that? Yeah, so just the question mark at the end of the benefits to the business community, um, just not, to, not to sugarcoat things. I mean, Paul and I and Abby have all been involved in our share of multi-states in our past uh, careers. Um, and, and the process of a multi-state can sometimes be drawn out um, for multiple reasons, including because when you have multiple states working together, um, that means there's actually multiple sovereigns working together, and they all have to get approvals from their various chain of commands at different um, time periods. So um, that is sometimes uh, is a challenge, even though there are certainly benefits to multi-states also that Abby mentioned. But, um, you know, one of the one of the things that is useful for you to know is how to actually deal with those challenges. And I think that's where we turn to Paul for the next slide. Yeah, thanks. And I, I totally agree. Right. Um, you know, uh, with with 
your last point there, Beth, and it is a nice segue here to, as to what to expect if, if there are, you know, multiple states that are inquiring. And, and yes, I mean, multi-states are somewhat notorious for being a little bit unwieldy and, and potentially, you know, can, can take a, a great amount of time. And it's for that exact reason that Beth just said, right? Um, you know, the, the states don't represent the collective group, they represent each respective state, which is really hitting at a lot of the points here that we have in, in tip number four. Um, first, understand the structure of the multi-state, right? So generally, I mean, multi-states come in all shapes and forms, but generally speaking, you have one or two lead states, you have an executive committee of states that, you know, may be somewhere like eight, nine states, and then you've got the working group that's a, the, the bigger body of states. Um, the folks that, that you are primarily going to be dealing with are the lead states and the executive committee of states. Um, but, but again, to sort of emphasize this point, every state has their own vested sovereign interest in this. And so, you know, throughout the course of a multi-state investigation, you may have individual states that have particular interests that are, that are uniquely important to that state that become, that bubble up and become an issue for, for that state that you may have to contend with. Um, you know, know that in a multi-state, um, the states are, are going to pool together all of the legal authority and obligations that are within their state and pick and choose from the strongest, right? So to some of Abby's points from earlier, you know, when you get a, a subpoena in a multi-state, there's probably a reason why that particular state sent it. Um, and so, you know, if you get interrogatories from that state, you, you're gonna, there's, there's a reason why that happened. And it may be because of the unique authority that that, that state has. Um, you know, I, I, we've put in here this art of collective versus individual conversations. Um, you know, it, it is somewhat of an art. Um, having a dialogue with potentially 56 different sovereigns uh, can be a challenge. And even with that kind of leadership structure, um, you know, it, it may or may not be easy to filter all those conversations and communications through one or two particular states especially where you've got the circumstance like I talked about before, where there are unique issues with individual states that, that have to be addressed. So really understanding the makeup and how to appropriately, appropriately communicate is key because as much as you may want to reach out and pick off one or two states, the states have you know, established this structure for a reason and they have leaders for a reason. And so again, you really wanna evaluate the, the best approach that, that you wanna use. Finally, you know, Abby hinted at it, the respondent driven multi-states. I won't add anything to this, but just know that there, is, there are times where you know, it is valuable for a target of multiple state inquiries that are all independent to offer and pitch like, hey, I want this done collectively. It's going to be more efficiency. It's going to be more efficient for me to operate in, in that fashion. It's just like essentially structuring an MDL. Um, you know, it's really no different. There are many times that a particular target who's subject to multiple litigation throughout the country is going to seek to combine that into an MDL. Same concept here. Try to pull those, those states together and get one conversation going so you know what the standards are going to be. Beth, can you quickly talk about competitor complaints? You're on mute, Beth. Thank you. Um, at least, at least my internet wasn't breaking up that time. Um, so there are a few ways that you could go about actually uh, raising uh, complaints regarding um, your competitors uh, to an AG's office and bring them to their attention. Um, some of those ways could include discussing um, with a, the relevant working group that um, would get to a, a large group of states at once or uh, key states for you or your industry. And, um, but, but you do need to consider whether you should. So consider the consequences. And as we have there, a nice picture of uh, Pandora's box as Paul will uh, discuss more in the next slide. Yeah, and obviously, so this is this takes us to tip number five, um, which is our last tip this afternoon of do your homework before you point the finger, which may seem, again, obvious, but, um, you know, there's different aspects to that. I mean, first, um, know, know who you want to approach with that information, you know, about a competitor. Um, you know, is there a particular AG who is sensitive to these issues or, you know, at, at a recent meeting has, has made this a priority or, or is really focused on this particular topic? Um, so, you know, think about 
the right state you want to approach. Um, you know, this one, I'm, everyone I'm sure wants to make sure their own conduct is above board before um, they do that reach out. But, but when you think about that, remember what Beth was, was saying earlier, you really need to think about all the different sources of information that may be out there about your conduct. So don't just rely on complaints that are incoming directly to you. You need to do some proactive engagement and figure out um, you know, whether or not you have complaints that are sitting in, in AG offices, in particular the AG offices you want to approach. Um, go do that proactive engagement and go and see and, and make sure that you feel comfortable um, with it uh, before you reach out. And then very importantly, uh, know the, the open records laws in that state and the implications of, of you going and reporting a competitor. If you give a packet of information about a competitor, is that packet now an open record? And it, are you going to be identified as having turned in a competitor? Because that could have all sorts of, of, of backlash on you that, that you may want to avoid. Um, you know, we've listed a few states here. Uh, I'm not going to go in depth just in the interest of time, but, but just note, you know, there are some differences that are important, like, you know, California and Utah have, have very specific investigative exemptions that may keep those complaints that come in confidential from, from an open records request. But compare that to Texas, for example, who has no investigative exemption to the open records law. And so complaints that come in are, are generally going to be treated as, as an open record and, and are available. Florida is notorious for its, its broad um, open government policies and the fact that you can get information that way. But again, there are unique ways that you can kind of get around that, that Florida um, issue. It's just make sure you do your homework and know what those, those laws are in that particular state. Um, Abby, anything to add on the open records front real briefly? Uh, briefly, it definitely depends on the states. Some states will turn over the entire complaint if they get an open records request. Some will turn it over with redaction on the name and address of whoever filed it. Um, some will say we won't turn it over at all. So very, very different between the states. Yeah, great point. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, this takes us to sort of the, the, you know, end of our presentation and really to think about, you know, based on everything that we talked about with state AGs, when should you be conducting a legal review? And there's really kind of three phases in, in my mind that, that you know, we wanna highlight um, based on everything we talked about. Obviously there's a preventative review. You know, you before you are making a new offering publicly, think about all the things that we just talked about um, you know, when it comes to a state AG, the various laws in the jurisdictions that you're gonna be making that offering, how an AG might look to this particular conduct, is it something that's already an issue on their radar? Um, so really knowing on the front end what to expect is gonna be key to help develop that offering. Um, be proactive, right? So don't just rely on that initial review, um, stay in touch with what AGs are focused on and what's important to them, because as that evolves, suddenly conduct that you felt comfortable with a year or two ago, you may want to reevaluate as, as the AG priorities are, are also changing. And then finally um, is reactive. Obviously, you know, if you receive an, an inquiry, you want to be responsive, you want to engage with that office, and you want to think about the ways that you're responding. Um, and it doesn't just mean, you know, when you get a formal subpoena or anything from them, keep that reactive nature ongoing, you know, respond to consumer complaints, engage with the AG office in a way that, that you get to know them. If there's one thing that's a common message that I've heard at all the various meetings that these AGs have, it's that they want to hear from businesses. They want to know them. They want to feel comfortable with that business so that if and when an issue arises, they know that they can trust you and that that's something that, that they're going to be able to work with you um, on a resolution. Um, so like we said, I know there's a bunch of things in the Q&A and chat. Um, you know, please look for an upcoming episode of our uh, Ad Law Access podcast where um, we're going to be providing responses to those questions and, and any additional information that folks want to know. And, you know, finally, we'll just give a nice thank you. Um, you know, our contact information is on here. If there are questions that you didn't get in that you want to ask, please feel free to shoot them to us. And, you know, we can incorporate all of that into um, our upcoming podcasts. And, and finally, the moment you have all been waiting for, um, the big reveal of the course code uh, for CLE. So again, um, on that forum that you received 
uh, when you registered for the course, please feel free to add that code so that you can get CLE credit for this. So thank you again, everybody. Um, we've provided a QR code here for our uh, link tree where you can get all the various updates on consumer protection, advertising, privacy law trends, and, and other developments um, through our ad law group at Kelly Dry. Um, I thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Abby and Beth, for your participation today and um, look forward to answering all of your questions in an upcoming podcast. Thank you. Thank you.